So today I'll be talking about sled dogs from historical use to today's tourism industry. And the reason I think it's really important to center a discussion on, on history is that any animal use, we're looking at a number of things. We're looking at culture, we're looking at tradition, we're looking at kind of the, the history of evolution, and we're also looking at biology. And so those factors uh, play a role in how we make decisions going forward. And so we'll start with kind of what we know about dog sledding history. Um, there's a lovely professor named Dr. Robert Luzzi at the University of Alberta who studies human dog relationships in archaeology. And uh, there's a video that people can look at in the future when my slides are available. And so what they look at for sled dogs are a sign of short, dense bones a cross between a human weightlifter and a long distance runner. And there's quite a bit of scientific evidence just recently being found on this. I'll show you uh, this specific uh, image of a bone carving that was found at a site that's 2000 years old. And uh, while there is a site 9,000 years old where they have some evidence of sled dog use, this site that's 2000 years old is much more uh, rich in what it has to offer. So the site has at least 128 uh, dogs and the bones of dogs. And it shows some, some killing that occurred likely ritualistically of young dogs. And so they think that this is early domestication, uh, essentially determining dogs that were too aggressive to, to perform. And uh, they also had some, some reindeer bones around. There was some reindeer farming as well as using reindeer bones for uh, the sledding and for the harnesses. And so that's what's quite unique about this site is that uh, the materials didn't break down that they were using for harnesses. And for the sleds themselves, um, there's often things like whale bones being used. And so they also saw at the site some, some middens, um, and that's kind of garbage heaps that show where dogs may have been used as well as a backup food source. It was not a, a primary food source, but and in times of survival, it, it was necessary to eat dogs. And so uh, I think that that continued, I think there's a, essentially a thousand year old evidence of a genetically unique dog that's now called the Canadian Inuit dog. And what's fascinating about this breed is that it exists pre-colonialism. And uh, really what's also exciting about them is that they came over Greenland, over to Canada, and so that this is one of the, the main resources for travel for uh, what was then the, the Tool people. And so the Inuit in Canada now are the descendants of the Tool people. And so they're genetically distinct from Siberian Huskies, Alaskan Huskies, and Malamutes. And uh, certainly they had a lot to offer. Everything was based on survival at that time, and so uh, these lovely dogs, short to the ground, you know, weren't likely to freeze, had very thick coats, and were providing transportation, but also hunting skills. And so they could help find animals, they could also retrace routes that were lost. And so they provided this kind of symbiotic relationship where people could uh, rely on the dogs and the dogs could rely on the people to survive and survive well. And as Europeans came to Canada and uh, there were trappers and traders, they actually started to take on these dogs and adopt them as a primary means of transportation. Uh, so they were also used for the fur trade. And then really we start to have photos of sled dogs uh, really in the early 1900s. And I think this photo is fascinating. It comes from the first uh, or the or the final attempt to get to the North Pole. And this boat set off with 246 dogs uh, to head up and try to get to the North Pole. And um, certainly, as you can imagine, you can see in that photo, um, it's uh, Robert E. Peary who, who made it to the North Pole said, I shall never forget the frightful noise, the choking stench and the terrible confusion our decks were a mess. And so the reason that dogs were part of this journey is that uh, there was really no other way to get to the North Pole. And so these uh, Inuit sledges and Inuit people were, were paid by Robert E. Peary to um, 
essentially get to the North Pole. And as you can see here, the sled dog setup looks a lot different than what you might imagine today, where all the dogs are pulling at the same uh, rate. They're all, their heads are all in line. And um, certainly they were kept alive and thriving so that they could meet this goal. And so it was a common goal. You can see here all of the teams taking a rest, uh, just, you know, you couldn't really see much. And they, they had all kinds of adventures. You can go to the source and learn <laughs> about the, the dogs falling into the water and being pulled out and surviving. Um, but certainly what's important here is that any time that the dogs weren't doing well or the people weren't doing well, uh, Piri, who was leading the expedition, sent them back to the camp and, and really prioritized their well-being. And then the story kind of turns um, after this. Certainly the, um, the dogs continued to be really important for Inuit people to maintain uh, their semi-nomadic lifestyle. And in the 1920s, some laws started to be put into place that restricted the movement of, of dogs. And so the RCMP and the Canadian government at the time said that, um, you know, restricting their movement was for health and safety. And so they, they put laws in place that said that the dogs had to be tied up. It was illegal for them to run loose. And what happened with this law, which was pretty interesting, is that they essentially would take the dogs and say, okay, well, if you want them back, you have to pay. And many of the Inuit people were still living a nomadic lifestyle where they were hunting and fishing and living off of uh, what they could. And so money wasn't factoring in to any of their <laughs> decision-making around how to survive. And so they couldn't get the dogs out. And um, sadly, you know, they went from having maybe 20,000 estimated dogs in the area to um, these, this specific Canadian Inuit dog was down to maybe 300 dogs by the end of this systemic uh, killing that was happening. And uh, I bring this up specifically because the, the application of these laws happened, it just, it coincided with the settlement of uh, essentially white individuals coming into the Arctic. And so um, there's this is all coming from the Canadian Encyclopedia and you can read about it as well. But certainly um, there was other systemic oppression going on at the time. And so um, it, it, was, it was quite problematic because, and it, it states this in the article as well, that uh, they didn't understand the desire to manage these animals by tying them up or constraining them because having lived with them for, for thousands of years, they understood that the dogs needed constant exercise in order to maintain strength to pull sleds. And there were other things going on at the time, um, such as forced relocations and residential schools. And so it was seen as uh, essentially a coercion and killing of sled dogs as an overarching assimilation strategy. And I bring all of this up because uh, it's it's not just sort of a he said, she said situation, but the Canadian government did apologize on this and, and to say, yeah, what we did here was wrong. And um, they've actually funded $70,000 for a sled dog revitalization program uh, that said the genetics are more or less lost. They, they've had to interbreed. And um, so... <laughs> I guess, you know, for me, learning about this was really meaningful because, again, there's such a, a focus on, on survival and the dogs being part of a family and there is a structure there in place that um, there was an understanding of the dog's needs and how the dog's needs needed to be met. And it was the colonization that completely transformed what that relationship looked like. And so today, certainly dogs are still a really big part of, of Inuit uh, lifestyle and um, part of the family and important for uh, essentially doing all the things like, like hunting and, and surviving in such a harsh climate. So now I'll pivot and, and take us into the dog sledding tourism industry today. And uh, while I don't have lots of slides about what dog sledding looks like, I think it's it's quite prevalent in terms of what what you could imagine. Um, you know, uh, someone going out for for a fun adventure, a couple hours, 
and, and a sled being pulled up by eager dogs. And that is what was very prevalent. And yet the imagery of what some of these large scale operations look like behind the scenes is not as prevalent. It's not shared by uh, the, the, those that are putting the tours out there. And so to show some examples of what the living situations might look like, this is in the summertime at a, an operation with just under a hundred dogs. And then this is a video that I'll share some of, and um, it's a larger operation. And what you can see, if you kind of keep an eye on some of the different dogs is that there is, there is excitement, there's energy. Um, certainly this is a time where they're putting in dogs, taking out dogs out to, for the sled tour. Um, but the members of the public, they don't see any of this. This is just um, what, what's behind the scenes. And um, essentially it's, it's a very common circumstance where the grounds are bare because of the overuse of the pacing. And um, typically there's you know, a, a bull outside each one. The dogs are able to see each other, but they're not necessarily able to access each other. And you can see that dog being taken out. Um, it's not able to put its front legs down on the ground because the, the man is rushing to get the dog tied up um, and to, to move along. And I'll share one more video here. This is, I'm not sure if that went to the next slide, my apologies. Oh yeah, there we go. Uh, so that's one more video that shows a little bit of a different scale of this operation. And again, the dogs, when they're being moved, they're, they're not having free access to use all of their legs. Um, and, and everything is, is just very fast paced. You can see in the, in the bottom corner, there's a dog that's uh, quite excited, a white dog and, and very eager and hopeful to be going out. And, and that's the challenge is that they may have all of this energy, um, but if it's not their day or there's not time to get them out, uh, they, they essentially are running in circles to, to be able to get that energy out that they have. And just one more operation, and I won't show this whole video, but you can kind of see the scale of where this operation is. Um, and I'll just move forward. What you can see is sort of, if you speed up the footage, you can see those circles that the dogs make. And um, every operation is different in terms of the number of staff that are available to maintain it. Um, but you can see really that they use, in many cases, they use absolutely what's fully available to them in terms of the space. And so dogs are selectively bred for their desire to run, um, but in many cases, they may not have consistent access every single day to run to their full capacity, and uh, particularly in summertime when there aren't clients. Uh, dogs are kept on tethers in many operations and, and that limits their mobility and social interaction. And in some cases, depending on uh, the, uh, essentially the number of staff, they may have to live by their own excrement. And we know that's something dogs don't enjoy. Something that's commonly stated is that uh, sled dogs are different. And this is something that I've been really interested in because Certainly, we know the Canadian Inuit dog was genetically different and, and had specific roles. And so looking into today's sled dogs, certainly they have a mix. They've got husky in them. They often have racing breeds like greyhounds or other types of, of hounds and um, scent dogs mixed in. And there's also some purebred dogs such as Chinook and Alaskan Husky. So the dogs you can see pictured here um, certainly have some genetic diversity to them and aren't associated with a pure breed. The thing that really distinguishes them from maybe my own dog, also who is a double-coated mix that likes to run, is how they were raised, how they live, and what they do for work. Limited time for individual puppy and youth dog socialization has led some sled dog industry proponents to think that sled dogs have distinct behavioral differences from companion dogs that might make them more vicious, that are adapted to live on a tether, things like that. But there's no evidence for this. 
As dogs used to pull sleds have also been shown to be social and friendly and live in people's houses without difficulty. It really comes down to how they were raised and, and socialized in their early life. And so this normalized idea that it's acceptable for dogs used for sledding to be frustrated, isolated, bored, as long as they're working enough in the winter is counter to what we know about dog behavior. We know that they live in the present moment. Um, they don't have regard for the exercise. They don't know, okay, well, I got a good run in a week ago, so I'm okay. Um, certainly it's a daily, a daily need that they have. Briefly, I just want to mention that uh, when researching for the development of a national code of practice for all dogs kept in kennels, working dogs and companions, I spoke with Hills Pet Nutrition about their food testing facility because they keep all different breeds there for their entire lives and they're testing food on them. So I, I kind of asked, okay, how do you keep these dogs happy? What's your housing setup? And so working with a behaviorist, they discovered that to overcome all of these systemic problems of boredom and, and pacing and, and things like that, that the dogs need regular access to novel spaces and reliable social communities. They have free access to roam at all times in their spaces and are given access to different spaces each day. So those spaces are altered, they add toys and games so that they experience joy of something new and different. It keeps the dogs engaged because they have constant social group play and they have a relationship with a reliable human caregiver as well. But unfortunately, when it comes to dogs, the scientific community has focused on what's the smallest possible cage we can keep dogs in to be used for laboratory testing and still have it be okay. So there's little published about what acceptable housing is for dogs. Assessments about well-being tend to be primarily made on behavior observations, and we know a significant amount how to, of, about how to read dog behavior due to our long relationship, you know, 2,000 to 9,000 years uh, and their domestication. Certainly stereotypic behavior, so that's sometimes, some of that pacing that you see, frustration and boredom can be readily apparent to, to the human eye. And we do know as well from scientific studies that dogs do not choose to sleep, eat, or play near their feces. So why is long-term tethering a sticking point? So why is this something that's still happening and so prevalent uh, at the industry scale? Uh, the proponents prioritize the idea of health and safety. So there's a fear of injury. Um, they're able to monitor their feces to see if there's worms or something like that in them or if they have diarrhea, but they're prioritizing that over psychological well-being. And so, uh, you know, the, the thing that I, I've been asked is what's the alternative to tethering? Where, do, where could it go from here? And certainly there's an opportunity with dogs and what we know about dogs to create and maintain stable social groups and provide large, novel, and engaging social spaces and comfortable sleeping spaces for them that they can engage in. For dogs that do poorly in social groups, uh, settings can be stressful that have a lot of dogs around, and so rehoming is an option for them. And of course, um, if there is a need for illness and injury recovery, access to non-tethered isolation spaces that are safe for those dogs. And I wanted to, I'll just check the time, and I wanted to provide uh, some of the legal context for how laws are in place for these dogs and, and what's expected. And so every province has their own laws regarding animal agriculture, but there are some federal laws such as the criminal code. And the things that, that come up here, and I won't read through all of these, um, essentially is you can't cause suffering, you can't neglect, and you can't keep dogs in conditions that are unsanitary. But of course, you know, how are those things defined? And that's what it comes down to is it, when it comes, gets into a court setting, it, it ends up being uh, kind of a he said, she said of what is neglect, what is suffering, and what is unsanitary. There's also some additional legislation in place, uh, such as the Sled Dog Centers of Care Regulations in BC, which were developed in 2012. And essentially, uh, it's a regulated activity in the province of British Columbia. There's also uh, other context to think, and, and this is the Code of Practice for Canadian Kennel Operations that I was mentioning earlier. 
And this is a law in some provinces. It, in fact, the previous version of this is incorporated into law in BC, but not this updated version. And it does apply to uh, companion and working dogs and is a national document. And so it has some uh, hope for, for restricting tethering in the future to improve the well-being of dogs. And so to go into that in a little bit of detail, uh, the sled dog regs here in BC say an operator must ensure that each sled dog is released from its containment area at least once in each 24-hour period for the purposes of socialization and exercise. And while this is good in principle, there's, there's so many questions about this, such as if you're an inspector, what does it take to monitor for that? Um, certainly, it would take some kind of 24 hour monitoring to understand whether uh, an operator is actually complying with this standard. Another approach uh, in, in recognizing some of the harm and psychological harm that tethering causes is uh, to say tethering of dogs is not allowable as a method of confining a dog to a primary enclosure and nor as the only means of containment. And so certainly tethering has to happen sometimes. I've had people come uh, sort of from a, the other side and say, you should never tie up a dog. And certainly there are times where it makes sense to tie up dogs temporarily and um, it benefits their well-being. you know, it keeps them safe. And so uh, this legislation or this, this sort of guidance language is helpful in finding that middle ground. And again, just to think about how would you as an inspector identify compliance with this? Um, certainly there's opportunities to uh, not necessarily 24 hour a day monitoring is necessary, um, but perhaps a, a visit during a day. So every province does have a different set of legal requirements pertaining to dogs. And um, tethering has become normalized in society, but as we talked about earlier, it is closely tied to colonization. And uh, so New Brunswick uniquely became the first province in Canada to ban the tethering of dogs 24 hours a day. And so they say no tethering between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. except for short dur durations. However, again, um, monitoring is one of those things that's a little bit tricky. Most communities don't have officers working overnight, and so it would be difficult to uh, enforce on this one. Enforcement does tend to be complaint-based, and what, what can happen with industry operations such as dog breeding or sled dog tourism, a business can skirt the line of compliance. So they don't face charges, they don't lose their business, but they have the lowest cost possible. And, and certainly when it's not a nonprofit organization, but it's an organization operating for, for profit, the long-term goal is to make as much money as possible. And so that can mean uh, essentially taking some of the, the benefits that a dog might have um, and, and the funds that you might use for that and essentially giving it for, for people's use for their own well-being. And so uh, really at this point, I think there's some good questions to reflect on. What might a decolonized approach to providing care for dogs used to pull sleds look like? What kind of future do we want with and for dogs being used to pull sleds now that we have the modern technology of snowmobiles? And how does the current keeping of dogs used to pull sleds for paid entertainment sit with your moral values and ethics? And so I, I do want to, as a, a social scientist, I think it's really important to say there's no such thing as objectivity. There are always different perspectives and different spins that you can put on any issue. And I, I do have bias like we all have. Um, I, I mentioned my double coated dog, that's her there in the snow. Um, she loves the snow, loves to take snow baths. Um, she also loves sleeping both inside and outside. She likes to rotate between two different human beds, two different dog beds, four couches and the grass. And so I think that given any dog the opportunity, we will observe their desire and enjoyment of novelty. And that when we think about animal welfare and their well-being, it's important to not just reflect on what's the minimum you can do, but to reflect on how do you give an animal positive well-being such that their experience of the relationship is beneficial and, and that they're, uh, it's a symbiotic relationship rather than 
one where one animal is seen as lesser than and, and another animal, the human animal is seen as, as better or deserving of more. And that's all my all I have to present on today. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Amy, for your presentation. We will now take some questions. It looks like we have a couple of minutes. So if you would like, please send your questions in the chat to Sarah Meltzer. She's our speaker coordinator and she will gladly relay your questions to Amy. Hi, Amy. So we do have one question coming from Roy. Um, he asks, from the perspective of the animals, um, sorry, it was just going up. Um, what do you think is the right thing to do with the practice of dog sledding? So keeping it in um, compliance, but also being able to take care of dogs at this, the dogs at the same time. Yeah, I think um, certainly there are ways to provide for the well-being of animals. Um, and to meet their needs. And, um, and every individual has the responsibility to recognize their capacity to do that. Um, do I have the, the time and, and capacity to maintain a, a kennel of, let's say, 16 dogs so that I can engage with them and, and meet their needs on the, on the weekends? Or, um, you know, <laughs> that's what it comes down to is, okay, it's not okay to just meet their, dog, their needs on the weekends. You need to be able to meet their needs all of the time. And so while I do think it is possible I think it's common for people to take on more than is their capacity to provide the adequate care for the animals. And so I think what the future looks like is people learning about the, the behavior and the needs of the animals we care for and making better decisions about their own capacity to, to take them on and take care of them. Perfect, thank you, Amy. Um, I'm just reading through all the questions, there are a lot of them. Um, I am just going to go to the um, next question. Um, someone asks, um, my experience with sled dogs started when I adopted a Whistler call survivor. I watched the regulations be developed, but how do we enforce the, those? And are there any committees or organizations that do that? Yeah, so um, certainly the BCSPCA is the organization that has permissive ability to enforce the prevention of cruelty to animals. Um, technically, the RCMP also has the full authority to enforce that act. And since the, reg the regulations fall under that, it would fall to both of those agencies um, to, to enforce it. Uh, again, it's complaint-based. And so um, the, the government did not choose to make it a regulated industry that had uh, paid and mandatory uh, monitoring. And certainly that would be a way forward to improve the well being of dogs used for sledding. Um, perfect. Thank you, Amy. Sorry, um, my dog was being weird, so I had to go deal with him. But anyway, um, perfect. So we have a one last question that came to us from Alejandra. Um, I mean, there are more questions, but maybe we'll be able to get to them at the end of our conference if we have time. Um, so she asks, what is the main purpose of tethering? It is, is it just the simplest form of a kennel for dogs or are there other reasons? That's, that's essentially it. Yeah, kennel, creating kennel structures and creating spaces um, for dogs that are social like communities where the dogs live together it takes more time and it takes more human management and it takes more money. And so um, realistically, if you are setting up in a remote area like that one video that had a trailer, it's easier for them to set up a bunch of plywood and tethers than to put something more comprehensive in place with fencing um, and adequate heating and things like that. So it's, it's a cost issue. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you, Amy. Um, we do have a couple more questions, which are very good questions. However, we are at time. So if we have time at the end, for sure, we can get to those if you want to stay around, whatever you would like to do. Um, but yeah, thank you again for your presentation. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, also, if, uh, if you want, I can send you an email to um, of the questions if you don't, if you can't stay later, um, that you can answer and I can send it to the people if that would work for you. Sure. Yeah. yeah sounds good. Okay, perfect. Thank you.